Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a first-time guest tonight. Maurice Jackson is the founder of Proven and Probable, a website and resource dedicated to helping people learn more about opportunities both in bullion and in mining. Maurice, thanks for joining us this first time on Liberty and Finance. Mr. Kaiser, it's a pleasure to be here, sir. We were introduced to each other by our mutual friend Rick Rule from Sprott Asset Management, and I understand you and he have had a relationship for several years going back. And But I was particularly intrigued by your story of how you came inter- to become interested in the precious metal space and natural resources and how you picked up a mission and now are, are acting on that and have created quite a service of information for people based on your mission. So can you let us know from from being just a student of of uh, sound money and that sort of thing, how you got opened this sort of this this world of of mysteries that that a lot of us have have walked into and and found that once you're in, uh, basically, I remember the allegory of Plato and the cave saying once you've once you've come out of the darkness and seen kind of the, what the world really is in the light, you you can't go back and, and see it the same way ever again. So, what was your moment when that when that was opened up for you, and and where has it led you to? I guess that epiphany, if you will, occurred during the market crash as a real estate investor, active real estate investor. Uh, I was under the impression that the stock market could not have an impact really on real estate because real estate's a local market per se. And when the market crashed, I said, there's something I don't know. And I did some self-reflection and I believe in self-study, of course. And so what I did was I realized there was a word that we all we all use and it's the word money. And if I may, I, uh, it's this right here. Everyone calls this money. And I looked at it one day and I said, wait a minute. It's not on there. The word money. Why is the word money not on here? And then why do we all call it money? Which is a sophism, which is a lie that you've been told over and over again until you believe it's true. I don't know if you're aware of this, Mr. Kaiser, but in the top left hand corner of a Federal Reserve note, there's an actual spider. And if you notice around the number one, those are spider webs. Uh, I find it interesting that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing could take the details to make that. Also, if I look on the back here on the reverse, there's a, a language Latin. Now, I've lived in the United States since 1982. I'm a naturalized citizen. Uh, but I've never encountered two people speaking Latin. Never in the United States. So I find it interesting that we could put Latin, a spider web, and an actual spider, but the word money was omitted. And that's when I became, uh, if you will, a student of Austrian economics. And I listened to names uh, with high repute in the natural resource space, like a David Morgan. I learned through self-study what is a dollar and what money is, and then the difference between currency. And that just took me into this whole new path to where one day I stumbled across Rick Rule, our mutual friend. And uh, it's taken me to endeavors that I I never imagined I would... uh, uh, be pursuing, but the the ethos that I subscribe to basically is that I love people, I love investing, and I love teaching. You, you culminate those three together, you get what's called Proven Improbable, which is a company that I started back in 2017, uh, really through the likes of a, a Rick Rule and a lot of names that you and I both uh, respect and highly regard. Now, the mission that you have as part of Proven and Probable is to educate people on opportunities, basically trends and um, in value propositions in the precious metal space, but also opportunities in junior mining, as I understand it. Uh, can you let us know, and I, I, I understand you've attended numerous uh, industry uh, conferences in the, precious, in the uh, natural resources space and talked mm-hmm. with lots of leaders of various companies. So what sort of big picture trends have you become aware of that you think people need to be aware of? Because most people, I mean, if you speak, you talked about not many people know Latin, and I happen to know quite a few who do, because (laughs) you mentioned being uh, a devotee of both self-study and of learning that sort of thing, and teaching. Uh, I'm a homeschool dad. We have five uh, kids that have grown up and, and gone on to college and so on, and and uh, through homeschooling, and so we we've networked with lots of other homeschoolers. And frankly, there's there's quite a subculture of those who are devoted to the study of Latin as uh, roots <laughs> roots of the English language, you know, Latin and Greek, that kind of thing. But also uh, through our church as well. So it's it's funny that you mentioned that. But 
it's not common. And if you go up and down the street, what's also not common, if you talk to people about, if you held up a, a dollar note as you as you did there and asked people, what is this? You'd get the same answer. People saying it's money and you could ask them the same question, why doesn't it say that? In fact, that's how I got into it was uh, when my homeschool son asking me, uh, dad, why does money, uh, where does it come from? Who gets to make it? Who do they get to give it to? How does it get its value? And I couldn't answer any of those things correctly. So even after his uh, months of research on it, uh, it the, the, the tale just became more and more mysterious and bewildering the farther we got went down that rabbit hole. And we've never come out. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. But in your study of that, what do you think are the most important principles and trends that people need to be aware of that they might not be? I'm in a fortunate position, and I'm not saying this in an egotistical way, but from what I do in the public domain, I have an opportunity to interview the most respected names in the natural resource space, and these can be considered the financial elite in the world. And either on camera or out or off camera, there's a commonality, and that commonality is they make the distinction between currency and money. They're not synonyms. So I learned that. Now, maybe if they're doing an interview, uh, I'll give an example. If I'm conducting an interview, they may say money. Uh, but I will never say money. And I know offline they understand the difference, but they, they don't want to have the discussion of breaking down the fundamentals. Maurice, you do that to your subscribers in your <laughs> leisure. So, <laughs> so uh, I never use those words interchangeably. Now, uh, what they all do is pretty simple for the most part. I can't say all, but there's a commonality is that they understand in, in like currency and like money and money being physical precious metals. Uh, they would have a checking account, but they don't have a savings account. That savings account would be, uh, if they had it at an institution, they would take the currency out and purchase money and maybe have 10 percent of that in some uh, divisible currency as in a Federal Reserve note or a federal a two dollar bill, as most people would call it. But uh, and just if I may, if you're not aware, uh, there is a definition for a dollar that most people don't know. And that's a dollar is three hundred and seventy one point two five grains of silver. And that is in the 1792 Coinage Act. And so I try not to call this guy right here a dollar because he is 75 percent cotton and 25 percent linen. Uh, so when people say you think money grows on trees, no precious metals don't and neither do cotton nor linen. <laughs> so one distinction you made there that's important that most people don't know is the difference between currency and money, money being sound money. It has uh, lasting value, store of value, precious metals. What else? Well, a, a couple things. So, again, words have emotions. And so if you misuse words, they have an emotional effect on you. You know, if I was at a, a, uh, with my children at a playground and I, he put a blindfold on me, and if I heard a little kid saying, Daddy, I know my son's voice. If it's your child, I probably wouldn't respond. Right. So there's an emotional appeal uh, to words. And so if you misuse words, you tend to have the wrong results, good intentions, bad results. And so understanding the difference between the two, because this is what the one percent know, the ninety nine percent will not correct their vocabulary. They'll continue to call currency money. I find it ironic because I have an opportunity to travel the world. Whatever country I'm in, the citizens in that country believe they have money and everyone else has currency. Hmm. The moment I come back to the United States, we don't take that currency, whatever country I just came from. But what most people don't realize is, is if you do have an opportunity to travel outside of the United States, the first thing you do when you're at the airport, you're going to walk up to the currency exchange counter. Why does it not say money? So you're given signals. And I just find it interesting that um, they may be implicit, but you're given signals and people just don't understand how to act on them. Another example would be. Uh, we're so focused on a relationship with a certain company. So you're looking at a gold membership or a diamond membership or a platinum membership. But have you ever considered why they use those? Those the, That is a nomenclature for that tier. Why does it not blue or green? Mm -hmm. It resonates with your subconscious mind because you know it's valuable and it's precious. And the only thing you have to do now is convert that and actually say, why don't I actually own some? physical precious metals. And we, you and I, take it for granted because we've been active participants in precious metals that someone, everyone should know that you can actually own precious metals. And the reality is not everyone knows that. You know, two things you've, you've covered already have resonated very deeply with me. One is this recognition. You mentioned like having a checking account because you need to be able to do transactions. Okay. But for savings, don't consider the U.S. US dollar or I guess 
its equivalent in, in, a, in a digital savings account to be a store of, of, of wealth for you. Uh, my wife and I have had some conversations where even though your head gets there first, your, your gut takes a little while to catch up sometimes. And that is when, we, when we're taking uh, funds out of uh, savings to purchase precious metals. And she says, I, I just feel like we, we got to have more money in the bank. Money in the bank. I said, honey, this is money in the bank. This is real money. <laughs> You're just moving it from a, from an account that's out of our control, out of our hands. And that's, it's losing value every year into something that's, that's got, in, that's got stable value. You're, you've got it, you're actually putting it in a more solid place than it was before, but we've been conditioned uh, for yes. so long, just out of habit to, to not think that way. And the other thing you just made me uh, think about this idea that the currency that we're familiar with, because we touch it on a daily basis, is is the real thing, and other people's currency that 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 they have is is not uh, is not real money, and that just it it intrinsically, as yes. you point out, uh, brings us to the face that wait we can't all be right, and maybe we're all looking at this from a from a, a distorted viewpoint, and. Um, and that when we go into, you also mentioned that those words about gold level and that sort of thing. When you go into a casino, which is ironically what a lot of us are in when we're in the banking system um, or the stock market, that kind of thing. But if you go into an actual place that admits it's a, it's a casino, you see the decor is just completely gold colored. Everything is gold colored all around you. And when I was younger, when I first became of, of age that I could that I could go into one of these establishments, I remember hearing you'd walk in, you'd hear clink, 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 because it was the sound of metallic coins hitting a metallic pan at the at the exit of a slot machine where people had just hit a jackpot and they were being paid out in, in these uh, coins. And, and actually, at the time, the first time was in Reno, Nevada in about the like 1980. Three and by golly, those were uh, those were uh, dollar coins at the time. Anyone? Even oh, really? They weren't. They weren't silver, but they were they were actual coins. And then later they changed to just being metallic tokens that could be exchanged for coins at the cashier. And then later on, now it's just credits, just digital credits on the screen. Then you could print out a, a ticket and take that to the cashier or whatever. But it's it's always taking steps and steps and steps away from. Um, Real money, gold and silver, but meanwhile, everything to get your emotions uh, uh, misled with that is covered in, in gold color and silver colors everywhere around you. So it's it's so true that the appeal to our our instincts is correct, but the reality, but the what we're actually being fed is not real. So what what steps did you take to make it real? To get real first yourself, and then help others find that path back to reality. Well, first, what I did was I actually purchased some physical precious metal. And once you own it, you realize you own something that kings and queens have owned. Uh, it's precious. It's unique in that regard that there's only so much quantity of it uh, from a biblical sense. And I hope I'm not, uh, you know, stepping on anyone's toes. I'm, I'm a Christian, not ashamed of it. But when they approached Judas, just as an example, uh, they could have went to Judas and said, hey, we have 500 mules. Which one of these guys here is Jesus? And he's, he says, hey, Peter. You know my name, Jesus? No. Okay. Well, uh, we have 500 women. Which one of these guys here is Jesus? Uh, hey, Simon. You know my name, Jesus? Okay. Uh, we have 29, 30. We have 30 pieces of silver. Which one of these guys here is Jesus? Oh, the guy I'm about to kiss right now. Why? If you fast forward 2,000 years later, what are the mule and what are the women worth? The answer is zero. They're dead. If you had 30 pieces of silver that betrayed my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, you would not probably work for generations. <laughs> but if you just own 30 pieces of silver, they're still worth something. But every currency, not most, every currency that's ever been created goes to a value of zero. And that's something to, you know, put into the back of your head there is, why is it money doesn't? Why is it the coins that I use today? And this is probably a conversation germane to mostly U.S. citizens. But why do they make my coins? They're not made of silver, but they still look like they're silver. Mm -hmm. Even if you took it to the digital world, as some people like cryptocurrencies, why does a Bitcoin look gold? Could have used any color. Could have used magenta. They chose gold for a reason. And it's not even something you can touch. Okay. Uh, and then they use the terms that are used in the mining industry. I'm mining Bitcoin. So the, the, just think about the play on words. It is a great selling point, but most people, again, do not understand the prudence of owning money. I'll take it one step further for me. 
I tend to run into individuals that believe in the Keynesian philosophy of economics. And they say, we don't use gold anymore. And I ask them, well, why does the Federal Reserve hold it? And I don't care what time of the year it is, you hear silent night. gets very quiet very quick. They have no rebuttal. Uh, it, it is in the shadow banking system. First world nations, their central banks tend to have a commonality. It is precious metals. Uh, third world countries, they do not. Although in the emerging markets such as uh, India, Pakistan, uh, all of the Asian rim countries and so on, they have been, a, they, well, first of all, they have a cultural affinity for acquiring precious metals and uh, sharing them, gifting them on holidays. I have a close acquaintance who told me his personal story. I'll see if I can get him on to come on the channel. And that's talking about growing up in India through generations and generations of a family that struggled hugely with financial turmoil from wealth to you know being widowed and, and and only being able to be kept out of poverty by the fact that they had physical gold in a in a safe in their home were able to pay for weddings and funerals and that sort of thing and, and to get by uh, through decades uh, from that store of, of physical precious metal so there's there is a remarkable recognition uh, in the emerging market world um, and the other thing that, that brings home is it ties back to what you were saying in the beginning is that in every separate country, uh, they see, you know, we all see our own language as, as normal and everybody else speaks foreign language. But, but the same with the currency. They think everybody else has, has currencies and we have money. But gold is the universal there. Gold is recognized across all of those, is it not? It is. If you were to go to Venezuela right now, one of the few exceptions to trade coming in is the currency is not accepted and the citizens now realize that the currency they were using is currency. They once called it money. No, what's money now is gold and silver. And unfortunately, there have been reports that even the former president, his, uh, who's now deceased, his uh, grave has been robbed because in their focus, uh, the focus was on individuals that are deceased from the 1930s and 40s and prior because they were known to be um, buried with precious metals, mm. money. It's truly unfortunate. That you have a dire situation like that, and we hope that that never occurs anywhere, even, in, even there. But that's the prudence of owning money. It doesn't go to a value of zero. Where, in addition then to this knowledge of uh, the reality of sound money, so that led you into, I understand a portion of what you do on Proven and Probable is to deal with physical bullion sales. Uh, can you help us understand kind of what the range is of, of things that you, you can provide to people there before? I want to talk to you also about the, the other side of your, what you do, which is about uh, more speculative interest in junior mining and, and how those two come together. But could you first kind of wrap it up for us with the, sure. the physical side of, of the discussion? So on the physical side, what we do is we're proud licensed representative, independent representatives of Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments. And we have the opportunity now to provide all of our subscribers globally the opportunity to purchase physical precious metals. That's physical metal, as in a hold here, a silver eagle, being delivered directly to your residence. It's not a proxy. It's not a derivative. The physical precious metals, precious metal IRAs, offshore storage, and then we have uh, blockchain distributed ledger technology as well that we provide uh, globally to any of our clients. And so that really is one of my proudest and defining moments to have a reputable name, the most reputable name, if you would ask me, the Bentley, as far as precious metal dealers, Miles Franklin, to approach us and say, hey, we want to partner with you and do something. And it's been a wonderful relationship and we're very appreciative of that. And uh, so that now allows us to, uh, again, allow our subscribers to have physical precious metals because for years I would just advocate and educate on it, but I would never benefit financially from it. And this way, it's a win-win proposition because I did all the work for whoever listened to my interview. They went to whomever and purchased. <laughs> but I never got a thank you from the person that uh, where they purchased their precious metals from. <laughs> so you got you got awakened, then you got converted. You were sharing, helping to awaken others, and now you're basically helping them to actually get their unmet needs satisfied in that area. Okay, how about the the junior mining part of the of your uh, outreach what's what what's your mission there what's what do you what's your purpose for driving that how did you come to that and, and why are you doing that all right so if we go back to 2010 2008 to 2010 uh, i first fell in love with the value proposition of physical silver and um mm -hmm. I found that uh, I didn't want to listen to any other interviews regarding physical precious metals, just silver centric. And I had to broaden my horizons. And that was through, again, the names of Bob Moriarty, David Morgan, uh, Rick Rule. And I started to realize, OK, what about physical platinum and palladium, and rhodium and then gold? 
So I expanded that. And the reason I was just centric on physical precious metals, because I like tangible things. As I mentioned, I was in real estate and still am. Um, and I thought, and I was under the impression because I, it, you and I both know there's good names in this space and there's bad names in this space as far as what we do. All right. And I was following some of the names that were using fear tactics to own physical precious metals, which is not something that I subscribe to. I believe that precious metals are a savings and insurance account. I don't ever have someone come in my program, nor do I state that you need to buy silver today because the Federal Reserve has five aliens underneath and they just hit the wrong button. And guess what? Silver's going to expose to this price. That's not what I have on my program. And so when I realized that maybe the, not everything is going to collapse today, I need to take a look at some of these junior mining companies and they offer some unique opportunities. And so that's where, again, expanding my horizon and, and opening a new content and putting uh, context and putting in new content. I found out that I could speculate, as you indicated, and find junior mining companies that offer unique opportunities with really no competition. And so uh, the prudence is in the physical precious metals of owning that as insurance. And I speculate with uh, companies that we find that uh, when we vet our companies, by the way, uh, we vet our companies and they provide a unique value proposition to the market. And uh, we have a proven pedigree of success. And I know a lot of my subscribers get upset with me that I really don't tout all of our successes because uh, we really do have a very good reputation of finding companies that really offer a unique value proposition. So if people want to find out more about the companies that you're looking at in terms of junior mining companies that may, and, and you've, uh, you and I were talking about this, that in the phase of a, of a, the precious metals market that we seem to find ourselves right now, where after like six years of a kind of horizontal, uh, not really being able to break through um, to new highs for, for the most part, for gold and silver particularly, we'll talk about some exceptions, uh, but for gold and silver particularly, now we seem to be breaking out of those, uh, certainly gold has, and mm -hmm. um, that seems, uh, what we've been told by David Morgan and others that we've talked with is that that's likely to be very energizing to those uh, in the mining space that have been suffering for, for this more than half a decade. So in this period, um, where can people find out more about those companies that you think are particularly promising? Well, our website is very simple. It's provenandprobable.com. And uh, when they get there, is there a particular section they should be going to if they want to find out no, more about this? Uh, so all of our interviews are on there, and our interviews are done in YouTube. They're done in MP3 and in transcript. And uh, so what we do is we'll issue their press releases, and we interview certain said companies. The other thing, uh, I, I hesitated there because I was realizing that some, some of the precious metals have broken out well ahead. Uh, you mentioned back in 2017 in an interview at the Sprott Conference that you wanted people to keep an eye on rhodium at the time. Can you tell us that story? Oh, certainly. So I was, uh, I was uh, I am a um, part of the media that is at the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium. And uh, we had an opportunity to be interviewed by uh, small, cap, small Cap Power at that time in the years 2017 and they just interviewed Rick Rule and Doug Casey and a number of well-respected names and they asked me what I thought was on sale at the moment and I said silver, platinum and rhodium and the response I got non-verbally and verbally was rhodium. Oh, yeah. I saw that one. <laughs> what are you video. talking about here? Uh, and I recall after that interview by the way the person that interviewed me she said hey you know I've been doing this for a couple you know, I've been doing this for a while I've never heard anyone say rhodium why did you say rhodium? And at the time, rhodium was 900 to 950. And this is July 2017. Uh, rhodium just as of about a week ago is now, when you, here we are two and a half years later, 12,500. So it's not, we, we like, to, again, this is part of proven and probable. We like to identify undervalued propositions that nobody's thinking about. And uh, when you look at these junior mining companies, an example would be, the junior mining company can be in gold, and I, you know, I get some individuals that are into physical precious metals. I'm like, well, if gold isn't breaking out, then why would I own a junior mining company? Well, this junior mining company, a lot of them that we have, have uh, can go up 1,400 percent. Let me say it again, 1,400 percent. Give you a quick example. Uh, April 2017, we shared Nova Resources on our website. They were 66 cents. By October, four months later, they were $8.55. Now, gold didn't go up 1,400%, but Nova Resources did. And uh, we have a number of stories, maybe not quite that extreme, but 
200, 300, 400 percent is not unrealistic. And but I want to caveat that. When you look at the speculative side, we all tend to do this. I know someone listening is thinking this. Let me stop you first. If I were to go to someone like Maurice's website, Proven Improbable, or your website or another one, why don't I find some of these junior mining companies? And when they do a a thousand percent return, that's when I'll get the physical precious metals. Wrong answer. Mm. It will not work that way. The probability is so low. And the probability, again, of a company that is a junior mining company, and if we can step back for one second, a mining company extracts something out of the ground. A junior mining company is an explorer. Two different niches. And I did not know this. I thought mining companies go out and explore. They find it and build a mine. No, their niche is just to extract. And then they keep their eye on a junior mining company that's probably in their area called Brownfields. And uh, if they see that they've delineated it to where it looks promising that this is economic as well, then they'll buy them out. And that's an arbitrage opportunity, probably for another discussion. But just understand, it's a one in 3,000 chance of an explorer finding something that's economic. So just keep that in the back of your mind. The prudent thing to do is first own the physical precious metals. And and everyone says, well, how much? Uh, That is a personal discretion. But from the answers I've received over the years, 5 to 10% allocation is fine. Once you've satisfied that, it gives you peace of mind. Then you can look at the uh, speculative aspects of the junior mining companies if that's what you pursue, pursue to do. You mentioned, Maurice, that you're going to be at, or that you were at the Sprott Conference uh, uh, in 2017. I understand you're hoping to be at the Sprott Conference this year as well? It, with the exception of, uh, we don't know where the coronavirus that's is going true. to take That's true. That's true. A lot of us have travel <laughs> planned, uh, and we need to find out more about that. But uh, assuming that, that, as we used to say, assuming weather, weather permitting, so assuming that that's permitting, uh, I would hope to see you there at the Sprott Conference in Vancouver in, in July. Likewise, sir. I look forward to meeting you in person. We've uh, been speaking with Maurice Jackson. He is the founder and host of ProvenAndProbable.com. Maurice, yeah, we do want to get back to you and talk about um, more aspects, more advanced aspects like the arbitrage opportunities you were describing and so on uh, with you in future conversations. But thanks for joining us this first time here on Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. Mr. Kaiser, it's been a pleasure. Hey, everyone. Since I started this channel over six years ago, My mission has not changed. It was then and is now to help as many people as possible to take care of our families and protect ourselves from the undue risks that we're facing from our fiat financial system, the banks, the Fed, and now the tumbling stock markets. If you've decided that now is time for you to take action by obtaining real money, physical precious metals for your family, I can now fulfill my mission in a new way because I've established a relationship with Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in precious metals in the United States. Over 30 years, family-owned, rated a by the Better Business Bureau, with zero customer complaints over their 30 years of service. If you've decided that now is the time to take action and to acquire physical precious metals, just email me at libertyandfinance at gmail.com. I'll get you connected with the right licensed and bonded dedicated agents who can help you acquire the physical precious metals that you need to protect your family's finances. Again, email me at libertyandfinance at gmail.com. I'm confident that together we can take better care of our family's financial futures. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions.